Praise the Lord and God bless you and thank you for joining us for another moment of worship and fellowship under the program Anointing. I'm Apostle Vincent Acosta of Christ Citadel International mm -hmm. Church. Please, before we commence, shall we look unto the Lord in prayer. My Lord and God and King, thank you. We bless and glorify you for affording us another grace of the platform for the word of God to sound off to bless your people who have assembled in great anticipation and also great hunger for the truth. I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit who alone and solely and singularly know the mind of God respecting this moment and hour that you have consecrated to manifest yourself through your word, which is your word, your will in it. I pray in Jesus' name, inspire the truth that reward faithfulness and loyalty to bless your people in Jesus' name, that they will realize that their time with you was in the waste of time, but fulfilling and positively impactful in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn the Bible with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. And let us read the word of God. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you have wars. But I just want to just dwell on the A side of this scripture. For the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Imagine there are about seven, almost seven billion people on the face of the earth. And every day God's eyes go to and fro like a swinging pendulum. And one thing, the intent of God is one as expressed in the word of God. Seeking a, one with a perfect the question is this, will you be the one? Can God find you? The reason why this is important was that when there was a power vacuum in Israel, according to the account in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when Saul, having been ordained king and coron the coronation with such fanfare, and joy in the land suddenly became a disappointment and grieved God's spirit, grieved the prophet someone who anointed him. According to the account in 1 Samuel chapter 16, that at one point, God told the prophet Samuel to stop praying to him, respecting Saul. Is it not a serious case that God can tell his praying prophet to stop praying for a certain individual and that person was the king of God's people, Israel? Because as far as God was concerned that this man has reached a point that God doesn't need him anymore. I pray that it doesn't come to that. God wants, why is God seeking people with such heart? Because a perfect heart aligns with him. A perfect heart seeks the interests of God. A perfect heart, you know, gets broken with the things that breaks God's heart. A perfect heart is burdened with the burdens of God, with the curse and the concerns of God. And God can entrust you with certain responsibilities because he knows the heart. As it was evidence in the house of Jesse, when Jesse was called to line up his children Eliab and all these people and then some of them were manifesting the structure and the physique of Saul that even the, some, the prophet Samuel was carried away a bit until God called his attention that I didn't send you to go and look for physique and strength and people who have all you know pumped up and all that but I'm sending you here men look at outward appearance but I look at the heart of men the heart you don't need 
education to have a perfect heart. You don't need money to have a perfect heart. You don't need comfort and convenience to have a perfect heart. Before God, as a child of God, and in having a perfect heart is a great asset. Because if God himself, when he was looking for a king, he didn't look for someone with excellent and embellished credentials to come and lead his people Israel, but a shepherd boy in the bushes, shepherding a few flock of sheep, but dedicated to his tax and assignment, but with a perfect and a pure heart. God said, go get him. Later on, the Bible says in Psalm 78, verse 72, that God called David from shepherding the sheep to come and shepherd his people Israel. This is our task. This is our assignment, my brothers and sisters. Our task and assignment, that we should have such a heart before him. God looks at the heart of man, not outward appearance, not what car you drive, or what clothes you wear, whether it is fancy brand names or anything. Not how much you have in the bank, not how much stellar credentials in terms of academics, not excellency of speech, not looks. God looks at the heart. All those things uh, means nothing to God. But what he's looking at is that, yes, if you are blessed with all these excellent acquirements, let it also match with the excellency of the innate, the inner man. That, that is within you. God looks at it. So he says his eyes go to and fro. On the earth, seeking the one with the perfect heart, that he will show himself mighty. God wants to release anointing, release, want to release grace, he wants to send out many people are God who are crying out, God, send me, use me, all this. But with what motive? What is the motive behind all the, the cause? God, use me, God, this, God, that. Are you going to carry that heart and be loyal? To the call to the end. This is not a call to comfort. This is a call to serve. There are challenges. There are pitfalls and snares. Jesus said, I'm sending you like sheep to wolves. There are enemies who are out there. You will deal with detractors, disappointment, frustration, discouragement. They will throw visual darts at you, fiery. Dance will be shot at you. You will be betrayed, you will be hurt. Are you going to turn and run back? Or are you going to stay the course? Because if your heart is aligned with him, then you will say, as Job said in Job 13, 15, though he slays me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I trust him. The Lord spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that they may have a heart such as this, to fear me and obey me, that it may be well with them. Such a heart fears God, reveres him. It moves with this overwhelming sense that God is with me at all times. So I dare not make any mistakes. I dare not lie. I dare not manipulate. I dare not do anything that will not be for his glory. I dare not do anything that will bring embarrassment to him and to the kingdom. I dare not bring anything that will be a blight on the ministry. Produce a stain. Unfortunately, we don't see this these days. The fear of God in people's heart is out through the window. There are so many people who are doing ministry, this ministry, but, but the fear of God is not there. The fear of God is the overwhelming sense that God is watching my move. God is watching what I say. God is watching what I'm doing. God is watching me. God is actually witnessing, superintending me in ministry. So everything that I say, everything that I do has to be by the book. As it was said 
in the Messianic Psalms, some 40, verse 7 and 8, of Jesus, that I come, O Lord, in the volume of your book to do your will. If your heart is pure and perfect before God, you will live by the will of God, his word. Everything that you do will be Bible measured, Bible tailored. So that if nobody, if anybody says anything otherwise against you, then the word of God in Psalm 69 verse 9 will be fulfilled. See, the Bible says you are the apple of his eyes. Says every insult, every aspiration that they cast on you will fall on the Lord. What heart do you have? Oh, that they may have such a heart as this to fear me and to obey me. Unfortunately, at this time and age, the heart is for other interests. As the Bible says in Mark 7, 7, these people follow me with their lips, but not with their heart. The heart is far drawn away from me. Other interests are seized in our hearts. Other desires, other delights. People have other things that inspire them other than the word of God. There are people who are hearing me right now the God is calling them by the thing is they are dragging their feet. Let me go and bury my dead. Let me go and make my money. Let me go and do this. Let me go and accomplish it. Let me do this. But there are some who are also there who are supposed to be the right thing. But the thing is they have allowed the interests of the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the carnal world to have drawn them. So they are out there serving and doing things, but in a way that is also measured. Their heart is not fully in it. They are literally like, you know, mercenaries. The interest is not there. God wants you to prepare and equip your heart. Now the heart should be broken. The Bible says in Psalm 51, a broken and a contrite heart. Let us come to a state of contrition where we yield ourselves to God and ask him to forgive us. Search your heart, my brother, my sister. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to see him? God wants to reveal himself to you. But not that the state and the condition that you are in, not with this kind of heart. A heart that is Beside every other thing, some of you have turned your heart into grounds where you keep grudges, bitterness, unforgiveness. All sorts of vile things are stored up in the heart, the sacred place that should belong to God. Clean your heart. Let those things go. Let the spirit of the living God come and live in you. And keep a pure and a perfect heart before the Lord. Let Christ become your example as he was. He loved us to the end. The Bible says, Romans 5, 8, For God demonstrates his love towards us in that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be perfect. He didn't wait for us to be righteous. He didn't wait for us to be holy. He didn't wait to be so, you know, sanctimonious and pious to love us. Even in the state of sin and filth, he saw a perfect future for us. And that's why he died for us. So my brothers and sisters, let us check our hearts. The Bible says, and I hope that this is just as you experience. Philippians 3, 3, this is we are the new circumcision. Who walk in the spirit and do not put our faith on our hopes on the flesh. The new circumcision, why are we the new circumcision? The new circumcision are those who have taken the cue of Moses. When Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 said that the Lord should circumcise your hearts, we have to allow God to circumcise our hearts to remove the carnality and the flesh out of our hearts, out of our souls. There are so many of us who profess Christ, but our walk and our attitude and our manifest so much flesh and carnality that is uncalled for. It is a syncretic kind of experience, a walk. Half of the world, half of Christ. 
the Bible tells us, you know, the two that cannot work together, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says we shouldn't be what? Unequally yoked. There's no concord be between darkness and light, between the Christ and, and Belial. That is Satan's nickname. You can't merge the two. It's either you are holy or clean for Christ, or you are holy in the devil's camp. There's no middle ground over there. So allow the Holy Spirit to clean your heart and to come and live with you and to give you a decent heart, a pure heart to walk before the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I pray that this message gets to you. You are not far away from your miracle. And sometimes people are complaining, well, I've been praying and nothing has happened. I've been believing. Have you searched your heart? Have you searched your heart? What is inside there? What is within you? If unforgiveness is out there, you have been holding on to things for far too long. Didn't Christ die for the person who offended you? Didn't Christ come for that individual you are angry with, the person you are talking about, the person you are gossiping about, the person you are stabbing? In the back, didn't Christ come for the person too? Wasn't the person also what saved by the blood of Jesus? Or if even the person is not saved, isn't the person a candidate for the same blood that saved you? Sometimes we think, even among ministers, some people think, "Oh, I'm better than this. I'm doing this." I'm... It is not. We are. We not being called to compete. Ministry is not Olympics. Now people enter into an event and you see everybody in, in a certain lane as your, as your competitor. We don't have lanes that we are competing with. We are being called to serve in the broadening vineyard of the king of kings. And he has apportioned a piece of the vineyard for us to do his work. There is no envy, there is no jealousy. Farmers don't fight among themselves. I've got my piece of land and I'm farming this on this. I've got my piece and I'm farming this one. I've got my piece. One farmer cannot feed the wall. It takes collective work of different kinds of farmers. Dairy farmers, poultry farmers, crop and plant various species of plant farmers so that they can feed the wall. One man cannot save the world. You know, I'm talking about not Jesus. I'm talking about pastors and ministers. One ministry cannot save the world. And that's why you cannot do the work alone. So applaud God when he raises people. Applaud God when he brings other people. And don't see anybody as a threat, as your enemy. It is petty. We should rather be cooperating with one another. Supporting one another. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, when the Lord told Peter, go to the deep and cast your net. And he went to the deep and cast his net and caught a big catch and he couldn't pull. It was fellow fishermen who were lurking in the deep, who has caught nothing, who helped him to pull ashore. That is how we should cooperate. But somebody is furious. Well, this person came and took my people. This person did this. And if the people were meant to stay, they would have stayed. God will bless you, my brother. God will bless you, my sister. It is the ministry belongs to God. It is he who called you. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, faithful is he who has called you, and he will do it. Faithful is he who has called you. So irrespective of, of any particular ministerial challenge or whatever, God Almighty who gave his word, he says in Jeremiah 1-12, he's watching to perform it. He will perfect his word for you. And you will never be put to shame. So be strong in him and put away the bitterness, put away the anger, put away the frustration, the discouragement, the grudge bearing. Throw it, you don't need it. That is the, what is hindering you from getting to the next level in ministry, in life, in work, even in marriages. Unforgiveness 
is tearing families apart. Husbands and wives cannot come together to we call ourselves Christian family, but we cannot forgive and release. And bitterness is in there. And God's eyes is going to and fro. And any time he sees you, he imagine God sees you and looks up and passes you by. How will you feel? And it's not like God decided to sue, but the point is you are not ready for his visit. You are not ready for him to bless you. You are not ready for him to, you know, to come into your life to be a blessing to you. The eyes go to and fro every day. I don't know how many times God's eyes has passed over you. According to the account of the scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Seeking the one. It is not you seeking, he is the one seeking you. But if you are to assume a contrite heart, a broken heart, that is pure before God, you say, Lord, I give up. I'm not hating anymore. I'm not angry anymore. I'm not keeping grudges anymore. I'm not resentful anymore. I'm not bitter anymore. I'm not gossiping anymore. I'm not saying anything. I'm not throwing casting as fashions anymore. Take away the heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Now the psalmist says in Psalm 51 verse, creating me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. If we as children of God who has such a heart. Not only is God going to take notice of us as he took notice of David in the bushes. The man didn't have an internet. He didn't have a Facebook nor Twitter. The man didn't have an address. But because God's eyes was going to and fro, he saw him fighting lions and fighting bears because he was dedicated to his task. Dedicated to his task. From the heart. May God give you a good heart. May God give you a loyal heart. May God give you a sincere heart. May God give you an integrous heart. It takes one to know one. King David in second in, in first Chronicles chapter 28, verse 10 before he died. This is the advice he gave to his son Solomon. Say, and you, my son Solomon, see the Lord God. Of your father with wholehearted devotion, diligence, and integrity. For if you seek him, you will find him. That if you reject him, he will also reject you. This is the message I leave with you, my brothers and sisters. Seek the Lord God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with wholehearted devotion and diligence and integrity and you will find him because he's seeking you when your heart is pure and loyal to him let us pray say after me heavenly father I thank you for your word I'm truly sorry that I've not walked before you with a loyal heart and a loyal spirit please forgive me Father, search my heart and bring out all the, the, the wrongs and the filth. Give me a new heart as David prayed in Psalm 51 and create in me a right spirit. Let your Holy Spirit come and live in me. I pray in Jesus' name that you transform me and bless me. A loyal heart is what I seek from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you so much for your people. And I thank you for your word that has sounded forth. Yes, we are seeking that. Those with pure, loyal hearts. We pray in Jesus' name that by this moment they have been discovered by you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord increase his peace and grace upon your life. Until we meet next week, I'm Apostle Vincent Akosa of Christ Citadel International Church. Be blessed.